I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Economics Report. Continuing debt problems in Greece and Portugal. The banking crisis in Ireland. A trillion dollar deficit in the United States. These are all reasons why high levels of public debt are a big worry around the world. Countries that keep spending a lot more than they earn may not be able to repay their debts. That risk of default can make it harder and costlier for them to borrow more money. Heavy debt can also affect a country's competitiveness. Voter anger at government spending and taxes helped lead to the big Republican gains in America's congressional elections in November. President Obama says for the economy to improve, the government must cut spending and reduce its deficit. In February, he formed the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. The two chairmen are Erskine Bowles, a Democrat, and Alan Simpson, a Republican. In November, the chairmen presented their own ideas for how to cut the federal deficit to about 2% of the economy by 2015. The administration estimates this year's deficit at about 10.5%. The two chairmen say their proposals would cut the deficit by almost $4 trillion over the next 10 years. $100 billion would come from the military. Other proposals would cut the federal workforce by 10 percent and freeze civilian pay. The chairman proposed to simplify the tax laws and reduce tax rates, but they also proposed to cut some popular tax breaks. One target is deductions for interest paid on home mortgage loans over $500,000. Another proposal would add two years to the full retirement age for Social Security, raising it to 69 by about 2075. The commission includes current and former lawmakers from both parties. Other groups are offering their own debt reduction plans. Former Senator Pete Domenici and former Clinton administration official Alice Rivlin led a task force that presented its plan. That plan aims to save six trillion dollars over ten years. It would freeze federal spending for several years, change the tax laws, and create a national sales tax. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can download all of our programs, including transcripts, at voaspecialenglish.com. And we're on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. Women are on their way to holding more than half of all American jobs. The latest government report shows that their share of non-farm jobs nearly reached 50 percent in September. Not only have more and more women entered the labor market over the years, but the recession has been harder on men. In October, the unemployed rate for men was almost 11 percent, compared to 8 percent for women. Industries that traditionally use lots of men have suffered deep cuts. For example, manufacturing and building lost more jobs in October. But health care and temporary employment services have had job growth. 
Both of those industries employ high percentages of women. Thirty years ago, women earned 62 cents for every dollar that men earned. Now, for those who usually work full time, women earn about 80 percent of what men earn. And women hold 51 percent of good-paying management and professional jobs. Yet a study released in November said men still hold about nine out of every ten top positions at the 400 largest companies in California. The results have remained largely unchanged in five years of studies from the University of California, Davis. Also, a new research paper in the journal Sex Roles looks at the experiences of women who are the main earners in their family. Rebecca Meisenbach at the University of Missouri in Columbia interviewed 15 women. She found they all valued their independence and many enjoyed having the power of control, though not all wanted it. But they also felt pressure, worry, and guilt. That was partly because of cultural expectations that working women will still take care of the children. Also, men who are not the main earners may feel threatened. The job market continues to suffer the effects of last year's financial crash. Now, a judgment has been reached in the first case involving charges of criminal wrongdoing on Wall Street. The government lost its case against two managers at Bear Stearns, the first investment bank to fail last year. A jury found Ralph Chiaffi and Matthew Tannen not guilty of lying to investors. The hedge funds they supervised lost their value in 2007. But jurors said there was no clear evidence that they meant to mislead investors. The Justice Department continues to investigate other companies. And that's the VOA Special English Economics Report. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. German health officials announced on June 10th that bean sprouts were the cause of Europe's deadly outbreak of E. coli bacteria. E. coli infections killed at least 30 people since late May. 3,000 others were sickened. Most of the victims were in Germany. After the announcement, Russia said it will lift its ban on European Union vegetables in return for EU safety guarantees. At first, German officials suggested that cucumbers from Spain were to blame. Russia and other countries quickly banned vegetable imports from Spain and other European countries. The Spanish Agriculture Minister Rosa Aguilar demanded that Germany pay for her country's losses. John Dolly of Malta is the European Union's Commissioner for Health and Consumer Policy. He said a rush to judgment spreads unjustified fears in the population all over Europe and creates problems for our food producers selling products in the EU and outside of the EU. Some critics accused Russia of using the issue to try to help its effort to join the World Trade Organization. Russia is the largest economy without membership in the WTO. EU Farm Commissioner Dacian Ciolos proposed giving European farmers $220 million in aid. The goal 
was to help European farmers recover at least 50 percent of their losses. By June 8th, Mr. Ciolos had raised the amount to over $300 million. The E. coli outbreak was not the only issue troubling Europe. European governments and the International Monetary Fund were considering as much as $65 billion in new loans to Greece. Some officials admitted that earlier rescue loans were not enough. Thousands of government workers protested spending cuts approved by the Greek cabinet to reduce budget deficits. Separately, French finance minister Christine Lagarde continued her campaign to become the next head of the IMF. She visited China after traveling to India. Mexican central bank chief Agustin Carstens was seeking to become the first non-European to lead the international lender. Dominique Strauss-Kahn resigned as IMF managing director because of charges of attempted rape of a hotel maid in New York. He pleaded not guilty during a court appearance on June 6th. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can learn American English and much more every day at voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. The United States has a new health care reform law. The main goal is to ensure about 32 million additional people. That is about 95 percent of Americans who are not already covered by Medicare, the government insurance program for older people. About 16 million people will be added to Medicaid, the government health plan for the poor. The law will require Americans to have health insurance, with a few exceptions, or pay a fine starting in four years. Also in four years, employers with more than 50 workers will have to offer their employees a health insurance plan. Employers will pay a fine for each uninsured worker. Smaller businesses will receive tax credits to help pay for health plans. People not covered by employer plans, Medicaid or Medicare, could buy health insurance in marketplaces called exchanges. The idea is that competition among plans will drive down costs. States will provide these exchanges by 2014. The law is the biggest change in American health care since 1965. But it is not a government-operated health care system like the ones in other countries. President Obama said it provides limited reform. He said, this is not radical reform, but it is major reform. This legislation will not fix everything that ails our health care system, but it moves us decisively in the right direction. Barry Arbuckle is chief executive of the nonprofit Memorial Care Health System in Fountain Valley, California. He says the new law gets the issue of health reform moving, but he notes it is mainly health insurance reform. He says lawmakers will have to reform the way health care is provided. That means finding ways for hospitals, doctors, and other providers to work together more effectively. Mr. Arbuckle also would like to see more attention on prevention so fewer people 
need costly medical treatment. The law is expected to cost about $940 billion over 10 years. However, the Obama administration says the plan will cut the nation's budget deficit by more than $100 billion during that period. Last year, the United States spent two and a half trillion dollars on health care. This was an increase of almost six percent from the year before. And that's the VOA Special English Economics Report. You can comment on our reports at our website, voaspecialenglish.com. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Economics Report. The season for buying Christmas gifts was the busiest time for most stores and online retailers in the United States. Final numbers for the holiday season, including after Christmas sales, will not be known for a while. But a report on retail sales in November suggested that economic growth may be gaining speed. The Commerce Department said sales increased for the fifth month in a row. They grew by eight-tenths of one percent over October. But the report came the same day the central bank said the economy is not growing fast enough to reduce unemployment. The jobless rate is nearly 10 percent. So, policymakers at the Federal Reserve voted to continue a program of buying government bonds. That program, launched in November, could inject $600 billion into the economy. The aim is to increase economic growth by lowering long-term interest rates. That would reduce borrowing costs for businesses and individuals. But long-term rates have risen since the Fed launched its latest program of so-called quantitative easing, known as QE2. One way to get a sense of how Americans feel about the economy is through retail sales. Consumer demand drives about 70 percent of the nation's economic activity. The National Retail Federation says its members employ 25 million people in the retail and services industry. Those businesses reported almost two and a half trillion dollars in sales in 2009. Terry Lundgren is chief executive of Macy's, the company that owns Macy's and Bloomingdale's department stores. He said retail and restaurants represent one in five jobs in America. So if we do well, then we're going to be the ones that will start to lead us into a recovery. The kinds of stores where sales are up also says something about the economy. Stores with the lowest prices do well in hard economic times. But the Retail Federation said at the end of November that discounters had fewer shoppers this year. Stores that sell jewelry and other higher priced items have seen sales grow. Another change. Americans are less willing to buy on credit. Over 40 percent of holiday shoppers said they planned to mainly use debit cards instead of credit cards. Instead of borrowing money, debit cards take money directly from a bank account. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. 
This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. Small business entrepreneurs play an important part in American job growth. Small businesses have created almost two thirds of new jobs in the last 15 years. The economy has traditionally been divided into three sectors. One is the private sector, meaning businesses. The second is the public sector or government. And the third is the nonprofit sector. But now some people talk about a fourth sector. It represents nonprofit and for profit organizations working toward goals of social change and environmental activism. Universities are starting to offer training and degree programs to prepare students to work in this area. One of these schools is Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. It now offers a degree in social entrepreneurship. Bernard Turner is director of the Center for Social Entrepreneurship at the university. He says student interest is driving many of these new programs. Students are saying, Now, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I want to do something that deals with a social problem or a social issue that's dear to me. William Paddock is founder and director of a business consulting company in Tennessee called WAP Sustainability. He has a business degree. And training in the area of environmental sustainability. Recently, the custom packaging company of Lebanon, Tennessee, hired him to help make its business more environmentally friendly. The company makes cardboard advertising displays for sales campaigns. Mr. Paddock advised the company on recycling. And ways to create less waste. He also persuaded the business to use electricity from solar energy. William Paddock offers his consulting services for profit, but says social responsibility is a big part of what his company does. For us, it's about protecting the environment, being better to society. But also, there's an economic piece to it. We love to find our passions, but also save somebody money. There are now more than 60 American universities offering so called green business degrees. The definition of social entrepreneurship and the exact nature of this sector continue to evolve. Some people are more interested in social programs and charity. Others are more interested in business plans and profits. But the root of the movement seems to be a desire to earn a living and make a difference at the same time. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can watch a video report on social entrepreneurship at VOA Special English dot com. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. Recently, the United States Supreme Court decided a big case about political speech. Political speech is considered the most protected form of free speech under the Constitution. The case was Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. The question was this With political speech, do corporations have the same rights as people? By a vote of five to four, the conservative majority on the court decided yes. Companies Labor unions and other organizations may now spend as they wish on independent efforts to elect or defeat candidates. 
the ruling is based on the idea in the United States and many other countries that a corporation is a legal person. Historian Jeff Sklansky says a slow shift to personhood for American companies began with a Supreme Court ruling in 1819. It said states cannot interfere with private contracts creating corporations. In the ruling, Chief Justice John Marshall described a corporation as an artificial being that is a creature of the law. The ruling was unpopular. It came as Americans resisted big corporations like the First Bank of the United States, chartered by Congress. Some states passed laws permitting themselves to change or even cancel corporate charters. After the Civil War in the 1860s, the 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution. It provides that no state may deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. If a corporation is legally a person, then states cannot limit corporate rights without due process of law either. At first, corporations were not fully recognized as persons. But Jeff Sklansky at Oregon State University says that changed. He said the general direction of the Supreme Court and the federal courts was to recognize corporations as persons with the same 14th Amendment rights as individuals. Yet Corporations have a right that real people do not. Limited liability. For example, a corporation can face civil or criminal fines, and individual lawbreakers can go to jail. But limited liability means the actions of a corporation are not the responsibility of its shareholders. Jeff Sklansky says the 19th century development of limited liability helped shape the modern corporation. And that's the VOA Special English Economics Report. Next week, more on corporations and the law. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Economics Report. On December 1st, Ireland's Prime Minister, Brian Cowan, announced measures to cut the biggest budget deficit in Europe. He said, today, we've come to announce a four-year plan between now and 2014. It's to bring certainty for our people. It's to ensure they have hope for the future. The plan aims to cut spending and raise taxes by $20 billion. These austerity measures are a step toward getting aid from the European Union and the International Monetary Fund. But Mr. Cowan's government could fall before the next budget is passed. The government asked for help after weeks of saying it did not need any. The EU and the IMF are expected to provide about $115 billion, or about half of Ireland's economy. Ireland got into trouble by guaranteeing the debts of its banks during the world financial crisis two years ago. That promise has now cost over $60 billion. Roshino Sullivan is an economics professor at Smith College in Massachusetts and a former economist at the Central Bank of Ireland. She says all deposits were guaranteed. Investors who had bought bonds in the banks also received the government guarantee. 
She says Irish bankers and banking supervisors had too close of a relationship. Ireland was known as the Celtic Tiger in the 1990s. Its educated English-speaking workers and low taxes appealed to foreign companies. Its economy grew quickly. But foreign investment and low interest rates raised prices to levels that could not be supported. Bad property loans hit hard at Ireland's main banks. Unemployment is over 13 percent. Ireland's bank bailout and government spending have expanded the deficit to more than 30 percent of gross domestic product. This is 10 times the EU limit for a deficit in relation to the size of an economy as measured by GDP. But John James at Pace University in New York State says there is little the European Union can do. Germany and France want to give the European Commission more power over national budgets. For now, rescues by the European Central Bank and other lenders are the only answer in a debt crisis. EU officials want to complete the Irish aid plan quickly. They want to be ready in case of more bad news from economies like Greece, Portugal, and Spain. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. Many children first learn the value of money by receiving an allowance. The purpose is to let children learn from experience at an age when financial mistakes are not very costly. The amount of money that parents give to their children to spend as they wish differs from family to family. Timing is another consideration. Some children get a weekly allowance. Others get a monthly allowance. In any case, parents should make clear what, if anything, the child is expected to pay for with the money. At first, young children may spend all of their allowance soon after they receive it. If they do this, they will learn the hard way that spending must be done within a budget. Parents are usually advised not to offer more money until the next allowance. The object is to show young people that a budget demands choices between spending and saving. Older children may be responsible enough to save money for larger costs like clothing or electronics. Many people who have written on the subject of allowances say it is not a good idea to pay your child for work around the home. These jobs are a normal part of family life. Paying children to do extra work around the house, however, can be useful. It can even provide an understanding of how a business works. Allowances give children a chance to experience the things they can do with money. They can share it in the form of gifts or giving to a good cause. They can spend it by buying things they want. Or they can save and maybe even invest it. Saving helps children understand that costly goals require sacrifice. You have to cut costs and plan for the future. Requiring children to save part of their allowance can also open the door to future saving and investing. Many banks offer services to help children and teenagers learn about personal finance. A savings account is an excellent way to learn about the power of compound interest. 
Compounding works by paying interest on interest. So, for example, one dollar invested at two percent interest for two years will earn two cents in the first year. The second year, the money will earn two percent of one dollar and two cents, and so on. That may not seem like a lot, but over time, it adds up. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can learn more about economics with MP3s and transcripts of our programs at voaspecialenglish.com, and you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at VOA Learning English. I'm Carolyn Prasuti with the VOA Special English Economics Report. Unrest in North Africa and the Middle East pushed oil prices back into the news. Prices rose at their fastest level since 2008. Libya is not among the 10 largest oil exporters. But the rebellion against Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi reduced production, affecting the global market. In March, oil prices rose above $100 a barrel. Prices went above $145 a barrel in 2008. The price of oil affects prices and demand for energy, plastics, farm chemicals, and many other products made with petroleum. During the last week of February, Americans paid the second biggest weekly increase in gasoline prices in 20 years. The United States has a strategic petroleum reserve that contains more than 700 million barrels of oil. President Obama could use some of this emergency supply to help ease fuel prices. But intervening in the market could hurt oil production in the United States. Oil prices have been rising at a bad time, just as many economies have been recovering from the global recession. Also, several countries in the euro area are still struggling with debt crises. European Central Bank President Jean-Claude Trichet said in March that strong vigilance is needed to contain inflation. That could mean raising interest rates, which could hurt European countries heavily in debt. In the United States, higher fuel prices come just as General Motors and Chrysler show signs of recovery after their reorganizations. American car sales in February were 27 percent higher than last February. GM led all car makers with a 47 percent increase. High fuel prices reduce demand for big cars and trucks, but economist George Magliano says this time high prices may be good for car makers. He says with gasoline prices higher, some people might want to get a much more fuel efficient vehicle. He says gasoline vehicles get 25 to 30 percent better mileage today than they did three or four years ago. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. Share your stories about what high fuel prices mean to you. You can comment at voaspecialenglish.com or on Facebook at VOA Learning English. You can also download podcasts on our website and watch videos on our YouTube channel at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. Dubai's recent debt problems 
have brought attention to the growth of Islamic finance. A government-owned group of companies, Dubai World, has been seeking to restructure $26 billion of debt. About $6 billion of it is in Islamic bonds, including a $3.5 billion bond set for repayment in December. The biggest difference between Western and Islamic finance involves beliefs about charging interest on borrowed money. In Islam, the basic idea is that you should not make money from money itself. Instead of interest, lenders charge fees. Giyaf Naqshbendi at American University in Washington is an expert on Islamic financing. He says the bank will estimate its costs based on its fixed costs, variable costs, the cost of their employees, the rent, and so on and so forth. And from that, they estimate how much they are going to charge. But he points out that this system can make Islamic financing costly. The costs of the system are shared by the borrowers. The fewer the borrowers, the more each has to pay. In many cases, Islamic financing requires the lender and borrower to share profits and losses. Giyaf Naqshbendi explains what that means with Islamic bonds, called sukuk. He says the bond holders are buying a share of a business or property. If business is good, then they could get back more than they expected. But if it fails, then there is no guarantee of repayment. Islamic bonds can be structured in different ways, but a major idea is shared profit and loss. Professor Naqshbendi says Islamic lending practices are also supposed to be socially responsible. In world banking, the total share of Islamic finance is less than 1%, but it is growing at a rate of 15 to 20 percent a year. There is growing interest in Islamic banking in the West. London is becoming a center of Islamic finance, and France recently proposed changes in finance laws to protect Islamic bondholders. Estimates differ, but as much as one and a half trillion dollars may be managed under Islamic rules. In 2008, the International Monetary Fund studied the financial security of Islamic banks. It found that their lack of complex products like futures and derivatives limits the ability to spread risk. And that's the VOA Special English Economics Report.